With so many details of his death in doubt, we may never really know what happened to Michael Brown and why. Incontestably, the 18-year-old was unarmed when a police officer fired 12 shots at him on Canfield Avenue in Ferguson, M.O., on August 9, 2014, two days before he was to enroll in a technical college. The officer, Darren Wilson, was white. Mr. Brown, it almost goes without saying, was black. What the younger man had done earlier that evening, or not done, what racist thoughts Mr. Wilson harbored, or didn't, whether Mr. Brown was surrendering, with his arms up, or threatening Mr. Wilson through the patrol car's window, the answers to all these questions seem irretrievably lost in a cloud of contention. What we can say is that one man, having avoided indictment, is free three years later and the other is still dead. Neither that conclusion nor the uncertainty of what came before it releases us, though, from the burden of trying to understand the meaning of the killing, and in that sense Dale Orlander Smith does a great public service in her new play Until the Flood, which opened on Thursday at Rattlestick Playwrights Theatre. Portraying only eight people nine if you include her own alter ego she nevertheless brings the questions, the pain, and even the unspeakable thoughts of hundreds, if not millions, to life. Until the flood is an urgent moral inquest. Its technique will be familiar to those who have followed the genre of quasi-documentary, monologue-based theater, particularly as honed by Anna Devere Smith and, in some of her earlier plays, Ms. Orlander Smith herself. To research Until the Flood, whose title ties together the many images of flow and overflow in the script, she conducted a series of interviews in and around Ferguson. The play was commissioned by the Repertory Theatre of St. Louis, some 15 miles away. From the interviews she fashioned the local characters black, white, male, female, young, old she inhabits here. In their TikTok alternation, they could easily have seemed predictable. Rusty, a white retired Ferguson police officer predisposed to justify Mr. Wilson's use of his gun, is immediately followed by his son a 17-year-old black street kid who freestyles his fury about the daily harassment the police inflict on people like him then we move on to Connie, a well-meaning white teacher in a wine bar. Connie can't understand why her feelings about the case she describes it as a tragedy for both Mr. Brown and Mr. Wilson have alienated a black friend. But Ms. Orlander Smith digs deep enough into each character, and with such decency, that no segment seems obligatory. Even the worst human among them a vile racist, and homophobe, called Dow Gray is allowed his backstory, which helps explain, if in no way excuse, him. Still, Dow Gray, who fantasizes about lining up Ferguson's black males and gunning them down in order to make the town clean slash white slash purified slash like it must have been once, threw me out of the play for a moment. Ms. Orlander Smith is so skilled at disappearing into her characters that I had forgotten until then what her process involved. Theoretically, this was a man she had interviewed, stood near, faced. The psychological violence of that encounter seemed almost like a replay of the literal violence it was meant to investigate. Later, I learned that many of the characters Ms. Orlander Smith portrays are fictional composites. I'm not sure whether that makes Dow Gray more bearable, or less, the idea that there are many Doug Grays available for compositing seems terrible, if all too believable. Still, I think that if the play informed audiences about Ms. Orlander Smith's methods, it might help them better understand her aims. Some of her earlier works, like the autobiographical Forever, are clearly factual, 
however poetically the facts are rendered. Others, like the Pulitzer Prize finalist Yellow Man, are clearly fiction. Or perhaps Until the Flood is more effective for leaving you uncertain about which genre it falls into. The production, directed by Neil Keller, carefully splits the difference between documentary objectivity and poetic license. On a set, by Takeshi Kata, replicating the impromptu memorial of candles and stuffed animals that lined Canfield Avenue in the weeks after Mr. Brown's death, Ms. Orlander Smith moves from character to character with minimal fuss, adding or subtracting a simple costume piece, by K. Voice, but otherwise not attempting anything but verbal verisimilitude. Moody Projections by Nicholas Hussong, establish the locations, just as the lovely interstitial music by Justin Ellington establishes the elegiac tone. Despite this even handed treatment, I found myself crediting the black characters more than the white ones. No doubt this was in part because white racism, however outright or covered, is a familiar gargoyle, stuck with its one leer. Ms. Orlander Smith's black characters are much more nuanced, and able to explore themes that, coming from whites, would seem taboo. Point one of those is raised right from the start by a black retired school teacher named Louisa Hemphill. Acknowledging the damage done by racism, she grew up heeding signs that said, Don't let the sun go down on you in this town if you're black. She nevertheless concludes that Mr. Brown was not only set up to be a victim but also set himself up. Several other characters echo this thought. Hassan, describing the routine threat of death from police violence, says there is a part of him that wants to stand before a gun knowing that the redneck holding it would aim to shoot and not miss. And when Paul, a 17-year-old who lives, as Mr. Brown did, in the defeated Canfield Green Apartments, cries, please God let me get out, he means get out alive. Those are two of the saddest lines you are likely to hear from a stage today, and therefore two of the most important. Composite or not, they ring damningly true.